Our next speaker is Pete Bulet. Pete graduated from Southern Illinois University, where he and his wife Amy were both involved with Chi Alpha. Shortly after graduation, the two got married and moved to St. Louis, where Pete worked as a CPA. After a year in St. Louis, God called them back to Chi Alpha, so they quit their jobs and moved across the nation to train for ministry. They spent a year working at Georgetown University and then in 2000 moved to Charlottesville to start Chi Alpha Christian Fellowship at the University of Virginia. Pete is passionate about Jesus and helping students grow deeper in their walk with Christ. Over the last seven years, he has sent over 45 students internationally to give a year and pray about a lifetime. Please welcome Chi Alpha Director Pete Bulet. <laughs> well, hello, Chi Alpha. How are we doing? Travel with a few groupies here, but um, first of all, I got a couple confessions to make, and then we're going to open up in prayer. Uh, first of all, I never needed a cat for the edge of my bed. Um, I, uh, I, I, the only metal box I've ever been in is an elevator, thankfully, um, and uh, actually never even had my water bottle freeze on the way to campus, but, um, and I've never written a book. I've never written a book, but man, we've been blessed, haven't we, by the speakers so far? What a blessing. I'm humbled to be able to be a mouthpiece of the Lord this morning. Let's pray. Gracious and powerful God, we bow our hearts before you. We ask that you would speak. And we, we say when you speak, may all other voices be silent. And we open our hearts and say, your kingdom come and your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, when I was a, in high school, there was a team that we feared to play in both football and basketball when I played sports. It was called, the, the team was the Mount Vernon Rams. I'll never forget my freshman year of football, we had to travel to their field to play them. These, these guys were mean. They, I, I, I have a belief that they came out of the womb with little football helmets on, and, and in preschool, they're hitting the blocking sleds. I mean, they were mean. Well, it was the middle of the second quarter, and, and we were already down by several touchdowns. The stretcher had already been out on the field a couple times. We had a lineman with a broken foot, and now our quarterback is down. And he was my buddy, his name was Josh. I was like, Josh, you got to get up, bro. You got to get up. He didn't get up. <laughs> so that meant the backup quarterback had to go. And now the only problem was the backup quarterback was five foot two, 99 pounds. And it was me. <laughs> so I go out there. We're like backyard football, calling plays and huddle. Let's do a pass play. Okay, let's do a pass play. Why ride on two? You know, safety blitz. I'm sacked before I ever turn around. Couple possessions with me at the helm. The coaches call a timeout. They go out into the center of the field and have a, a, a meeting with the other coaches uh, from the other team and the referees. We're all wondering what's going on out there. About five minutes later, they walked back and they said, boys, get on the bus. We just forfeited the rest of the game. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Try going to school the next day. How'd the game go? Oh, we forfeited second quarter. <laughs> it's basketball season. Guess where we have to go? Mount Vernon. Into the first quarter, eight minute quarter, into the first quarter, 27 to 1. I'm a big sports fan. There's a key in sports that often plays out. It's called the home court advantage. It's about playing in the, in, on your own court, in front of your own fans, in a familiar surrounding where things are stacked in your favor, the home court advantage. What we're going to read this morning in Mark 5, you have your Bible, you can open it. We're going to see Jesus go into the 
darkest place imaginable where the enemy has the ultimate home court advantage, and we're going to watch a showdown. So open your Bibles to Mark chapter 5. It says this, verse 1, When they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes, they, being Jesus and the disciples, when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. And as Mark starts the story, he gives us a very detailed description of this demon-possessed man, and you get a sense that darkness had done its devastating work in this man. Verse 6, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want? with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God. In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. And then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And at that point, the disciples went, oh, gee. <laughs> We're, we'll be in the boat. <laughs> And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. And he gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those Tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and it freaked them out. Now, to uh, wrestle with the magnitude of this encounter. Let me give you a little background. We see Jesus asks the demoniac what his name was, and he replies, legion, for we are many. Well, what you need to know is that a legion was a term used for a Roman regiment that often consisted of about 6,000 soldiers. So here's what you have. You have Jesus in a Gentile region, which was known as hostile territory if you're a Jewish young man. Then you have him around a graveyard, which would be an, an, an unceremonial or a ceremonially unclean area. Then you have him surrounded by thousands of pigs, which, is, which were unclean animals in that day, facing a man full of unclean spirits who says his name is Legion. Now what you get is an unclean air region in an unclean area surrounded by unclean animals with a man teeming with demons, and you get the picture that this is the darkest place that you could imagine if you were a Jewish young man. This guy has the ultimate home court advantage. We are in the bowl season. In fact, in a month, the Super Bowl will be held here, Houston. I want you to picture something with me. I want you to picture the demonic powers running out of the tunnel into a massive stadium taking the field. The hordes of demons, a legion of them. I want you to picture hundreds of demons running out onto the field through the tunnel. Hundreds. And then more. And more. And more. And more. And more until the sideline is full of 6,000 de demons ready for battle. It's like the forces of darkness have, has, have teamed up with reinforcements for this battle. And then on the other side is one man, Jesus. Just Jesus, 
with his authority. And then I want you to picture these 6,000 demons charging at Jesus as Jesus stands there. And as they get close to him, what happens? They fall on their knees and they start to beg for mercy because they know this, a legion against one, they are outmanned. They don't want to fight even if it's a legion against one because they know legion against one, Jesus is stronger. So they beg Jesus to let them go to the pigs. And Jesus, of course, grants them their request. And literally, a legion of demons are thrown to the pigs. This story reminds us of the powerful truth that there is no place too dark. In the darkest place imaginable, where the enemy has the ultimate home court advantage, it reminds us that there is no place too dark for Jesus to be victorious. Let me say this, there is no country too dark for Jesus to be victorious. Secular Europe is not too dark for Jesus to be victorious. Spain is not too dark. Germany is not too dark. France is not too dark. Southeast Asia is not too dark for Jesus to be victorious. Laos is not too dark. Indonesia is not too dark. Cambodia is not too dark. In the heart of the Muslim world, it is not too dark for Jesus to be victorious. Jordan, Oman, Egypt, not too dark. Now, it may take decades and even centuries of the people of God sacrificially serving, but it is not too dark for Jesus to be victorious. The pictures you see on the screens are pictures of people in the last 12 months who've come to know Jesus as their Savior and who have experienced the victory of Jesus in the midst of the darkness. There is no place too dark for Jesus to be victorious. Now let me ask you a question. Do you believe that? I mean... Do you have a high and glorious view of Jesus, the Son of the living God? Because this is the apostolic hope that drives the mission. This is the apostolic hope that causes our heroes here, the missionaries, to leave family and friends and to go to the ends of the earth and the places of great darkness. This is what causes them to serve sacrificially, to declare courageously, and to give their lives generously. This is the apostolic hope. Well, let's keep reading. Verse 16. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man. And they told about the pigs as well. Uh, By the way, um, those 2,000 pigs, um, they're gone. (laughs) Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave the region. You know... I've always found that fascinating. Uh, Have you guys found that fascinating? Okay, they've just seen Jesus put his power on display, show his victory over the darkness, and now they're asking him to leave. And I I think, why are they asking him to leave? I can tell you why. Because their pigs are gone. You ask that question, it's because they weren't your pigs. Here's the point. They were more focused on the cost of the victory than the glory of the victory. They saw the cost of the victory of Jesus, and they didn't want to pay the cost. So they pushed Jesus away, and they say, would you please leave? And says they pleaded for Jesus to leave because his mission was too costly, and they didn't want to pay the cost. And what we see is, because they were unwilling to pay the cost, The victory of Jesus in that region was temporarily impeded because they were unwilling to embrace the cost because they cared more about themselves than they did the mission of Jesus in that region. Let me just say this, that is antithetical to the gospel. I am so thankful that the Heavenly Father did not think the cost too great. Victory is possible, but it will be costly. It will be sacrificial. See, it's one thing to know that there's no place too dark for Jesus to be victorious. It's another thing to be willing to pay the cost. 
The last World Mission Summit, we had seven alumni that came to the World Mission Summit, and they left on a plane from, from the World Mission Summit and flew to give a year in Cairo, Egypt. At the end of their give a year, they were talking about what they were going to do after their year was over, and, and uh, there are three males and four females that made up the seven, and, and two of the males said, uh, we're going to stay. Uh, we're going we're to extend our time in, in Egypt, and the other one was going to go home and get a job in, in, in the States and work as a civil engineer. Well, they'd heard that one of the young ladies wanted to, to stay as well, but she couldn't because she had student loans that... that prohibited her be, from being able to stay. And so these three guys were talking about, they said, why don't we do this? Why don't we offer her, why don't we offer to pay for her student loans if she'll stay on the field? Now they didn't know how many student loans she had. They didn't know how long that it would take. But they said, let's do this. Let's pay off her student loans if she'll stay. So they, they met her at a team meeting. They told her, we're willing to pay your student loans if you'll stay. And so she gladly stayed. And those three young men, two who stayed on the field, one who went back and got a job as a civil engineer, paid off $29,000 in student loans in the next year and eight months. And that's their picture right there. What a powerful picture of people like you who say we will embrace the cost of the mission, that the glory of Jesus in the places of great darkness are worth the cost, and we will embrace the cost. Let me ask you a question. The expansion of God's kingdom will be costly, and it will be sacrificial. But here's the question. Are you willing, and are we willing personally to embrace that cost? just want to quickly hit on two things of what it looks like to personally embrace the cost of missions. Number one is this, give first. Let your standard of, of giving impact your standard of living. Don't go buy all the clothes you want and, and all the technological toys you want and go out to eat all you want and the house you want and the car you want and the trips you want and then see what you have left over to give to missions. I want you to think now about what you would like to give to missions and determine what you want to give before you ever sign a lease on an apartment, before you ever buy a new car. Why don't you determine first what you want to give to missions? Put missions at the top of your budget spreadsheet, not at the bottom. Maybe you'll want to join the Junkie Car Club. I'm a proud member people who drive a junkier car so they can give more. One of the most generous people to ever walk into our fellowship, he now makes over six figures. He's been graduated for, for, over a do, for about a dozen years, and he drives the same Mazda 626 as he did when he was in Chi Alpha. He makes over six figures, guys, but he, he gives thousands of dollars a year to missions because he's a member of the Junkie Car Club. Maybe you want to join you, you can think about the guy who went back and got a civil engineering job. He, he didn't even have a job when he committed to pay off those student loans. But let me tell you something. I don't have time to tell the story. But he went back and God supernaturally, miraculously gave him a job because he chose to give first. Let me encourage you. Don't spend everything that you, that, on everything you want and then find out how much you have left over and give a portion of that to missions. Don't, let's not do that. Let's not be like the people in this passage who are more consumed with themselves and their stuff over the cost. No, no, no. Let's be people who embrace the cost of the mission and then see how we can adjust our lifestyles to that. Jesus gave his life for the mission. Surely, we can change our lives for the mission. So number one, give first. Number two, give faithfully. I want to encourage you to make it your goal to never not be supporting a missionary. I want to, I want to encourage you to never have a time where you're not, because here's the thing. Victory is possible, but we need a generation of people who will give sacrificially so the victory will not be impeded. 
I, don't, don't make giving to missions optional. I want it to be a deep commitment in our will that we will, let me put it this way, that we will see missions giving as optional as paying the electric bill. If you will do this, if you will give first, and you will give faithfully, I believe that we will see the victory of Jesus go into places of darkness that has not yet taken hold. I want to give one more image and, and tell you how we're going to close. Years ago, I read an article with an analogy about missions that I really liked. It was a picture of, of missions as, being, as descending into the darkness to see people rescued for the glory of God and the nations, okay? So this picture that missions is descending into the darkness to see people rescued for the glory of God and the nations. But here's the, the key to that picture, is that for somebody to descend into the darkness, here's the reality, they need somebody to hold the rope to lower them down. No one can descend into the darkness without a team of people to vigorously hold the rope to provide the support and the stability that they need to descend. You must have a team of people holding the rope. That's what we do when we support missions. We hold the rope for people who are descending into the darkness to see the glory of God in the midst of the darkness take hold. And what a tragedy it would be to have people who are willing to descend into the darkness, but they can't find enough people to hold their rope. They're running around from church to church from a boy, and they can't find people. Because people are too consumed with their newest toy. See, I believe this. I believe there's only supposed to be two types of Christians when it comes to missions. Those who are descending into darkness and those who are holding ropes. And we need every hand on deck. This is not a joke. Well, we're going to close today with an offering that is a bit unusual. We're not going to take up an offering per se, but on your way out, every missionary in our missionary family and missionary that's here has a pledge form. And we're going to ask that you would grab a pledge form on your way out and you would start giving to missions now. If everybody in here gave $5 a month to missions, then our offering for this time would be $150,000 this year. If you extrapolate over the next couple of years, it would be half a million dollars for the next World Mission Summit. So we're going to ask that you do that on the way out. Now, some of you say, but Pete, I'm a college student, and uh, I'm not, not making much money yet, and it's kind of hard to give the missions off my meal plan, right? <laughs> Which I would say this, I, I hear you, but let me tell you what college is about in my mind. It's about setting the trajectory for the rest of your life. And I believe this. If you'll start to give to missions now when you don't have much, then as God increases your resources, you'll give to missions later. So I want to encourage you today to set the trajectory for the rest of your life. I want to see you give first. I want to see you give faithfully. And I want that trajectory to start when you just have a look. Because here's what we see in the scriptures. That Jesus looks as the person who doesn't have much but chooses to give first. And he treasures that. And so let me encourage you to set a trajectory now. Embrace the cost of victory now. And let's be the best rope holders that any descender could ever hope for. I want to close. So as you leave, please grab that. Maybe go to the prayer room and say, Lord, what do you want me to give? And you can get online and you can, and you can make that pledge. And it can start monthly now. Set the trajectory now. As we close, I want to ask you two questions, and please listen to these questions. Number one, do you believe that there is no place too dark 
for Jesus to be victorious. Do you really believe that? Because that's the apostolic hope that drives the people who've flown in to be a part of this conference. And it's the apostolic hope that drives the church in its mission. And then number two, will you embrace the real and substantial cost of that victory in the darkness? Or let me ask it another way. Whose rope are you going to hold? I hope we have people saying, wait a second, I think I can get another rope. Bring it to me. And they've got their hands full of, no, no, wait, wait, wait. God, I can get one more. I can get one more. Whose rope are you going to hold? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to excel in the grace of giving. I pray that this generation of students would be known for their great generosity to the kingdom and its expansion. I pray that you would cause some of the people in here to be so prosperous that their names would be known and their faces would be on covers of magazines, but they wouldn't just be known for their money, they would be known for their generosity. I pray that this generation would be known as the most generous generation to ever rise up out of our nation. That they would be the best rope holders that anyone who's been called to descend in the darkness could ever ask for. That they would give first and give faithfully. In Jesus' victorious name, we pray, amen. Amen. God bless you.